All right. Welcome. Hello. Can everyone hear me well? In the back? Cool. So today we have the pleasure to introduce to you Professor Steve Keane, who used to be at the Kingston University London until recently. He now finances himself and his uh, activities through crowdfunding, which he will be talking uh, to you later. Steve Keen was awarded the Reverb Award for Economics for being the first economist to warn of an economic crisis in form of a global debt bubble since 2005 in his, on, on his website debtdeflation.com. Not without connection to this, he was one of the first proponents of our society, the post-crash economic society, and the Rethinking Economics Network, which our society forms part of. And when he first came to one of our events, with a debate uh, with Peter Backus in 2013. He used to be at the University of Western Sydney. Now, luckily, his way, his journey was much shorter. With his influential book, Debunking Economics, Professor Steve Keane has criticized mainstream economics fundamentally and defended a pluralistic approach to the study of economics. Part of his critique points to the lack of awareness for dynamics and disequilibrium in economics, which is why he would be talking about why economics should learn to love disequilibrium and money today. So without further delay, please welcome Professor Steve Keen. Thank you. Thank you. I've done a slightly different title to what I thought. I think that my point, rather than talking about why you should learn to love it, it's the magnificent failure of neoclassical economics. I want to talk about why I see it as, as both a failure and a magnificent one. And if you see where people think economics began, most people would say Adam Smith is the father of economics. I actually disagree with that. I think the father, he's actually seen him as the uncle who misled the family. And the real father should have been Cantillon and Canet, which is something I'll talk about in a future book. Uh, but if you look at neoclassicals today, they're not particularly aware of their own history, let alone the history of economic thought. They've normally abolished those courses at virtually every university in the world. So they have no idea of uh, how they actually relate to Adam Smith. But they think that they prove the, the classic uh, phrase that, that Smith gave that has really embedded itself in in people's minds so well, the invisible hand. Now, if you read Smith and see where did he use that phrase in The Wealth of Nations, it's here actually talking about why British manufacturers would not move off the offshore to Portugal to take advantage of low wages, by the way. But in this point, he said that uh, he, being the, uh, the capitalist here, intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. Now, it's the hand doing the leading, okay? the invisible hand fundamentally being the market. And neoclassicals would think that they've, that's what they've actually done. Well, if you look at what's happening there in that particular phrase, it's a vision of a socially beneficial outcome which was not a part of the agent's intention. The system itself generated it somehow, whatever the agent might have been inclined to do. Now, if you look at the, the literature that gave birth to rational expectations and so-called modern uh, macroeconomics. It begins with people like Sargent and Wallace. And what they are talking about is actually an agent who is so well informed that they don't even need a market in the first place. You look at the public knows the monetary authority's feedback rule, takes this into account in forming its expectations. So by virtue of the assumption that expectations are rational, there's no feedback rule the authority can use to fool the public. In other words, we've gone from a system like the market, which can take people who've got other intentions and produce a socially beneficial outcome, to agents in a system who are so all-knowing that they can rationally anticipate the future. And the question is, why do they need a market? In some ways, it's turned upside down what Smith was talking about. We've gone from a smart market, or in the way that Hayek saw the market, a system which generates deep knowledge out of superficial knowledge into something where the market is almost non-existent and the agents in the market are gods. Now, how did we get there? Well, there have been lots of intermediate steps, and I'll be talking about this when I finally write uh, the sequel to Debunking Economics, which is going to be some years in the, the future, I think. Mm -hmm. 
because every time neoclassicals attempted to prove the stability of some dynamic process, some iterative process leading, they believed, to equilibrium, they ended up proving the opposite, not stability but instability. And you really, I think, in, in terms of who you'd relate it back to, Volrar, I think, is the one who was the first real attempt to do mathematical modelling at this scale. You had Corno back in the early 1800s, but Volrar set the, the tone for neoclassical economics for quite some time. And he had the idea of a multi-market equilibrium. The idea of a room like this, everybody comes inside with goods that they have to sell, maybe depending upon the price, with goods they want to buy, depending upon the price. And some person like me stands down the front of the room and calls out a random set of prices. And then everybody works out what they want to buy and sell at that random set of prices. Which have I got too much? Which have I got too little given that set of prices? And then the prices where the demand is greater than supply will rise. Those where the offer exceeds demand will fall. And this will keep on happening over a while. And when only when all, every last good, demand equals supply for every last good, then trade takes place. Okay? Volrar's vision was a system where the prices did, exchange did not occur in any single market until all markets were in equilibrium. Now, he thought that would converge. And he had every right to believe that because the mathematics hadn't been established when he wrote it. So he actually, again, his language is good here. He says, this will appear probable. He didn't have a proof for it. He said, because the change in the price of the good of B from P dash B to P double dash B, the, the first iteration in prices, invariably pushed the system to equilibrium, towards equilibrium for that individual good. So if demand's greater than supply, you know, you, you put up the price to reduce demand, that's, that's heading towards equilibrium in that individual market. But what happens in market B affects what happens in market C, D, E, et cetera, et cetera. So he said the changes in other markets, well, in some cases it'll, put, it'll move it away from equilibrium, in others it'll move towards equilibrium. And he said overall they seem to cancel out. So the new set of prices will be closer to equilibrium than the original set and ultimately will converge to equilibrium. Now that's, that's just, I simply can't criticise that as a hypothesis. Okay? It's a valid guess as to what's likely to happen. Unfortunately, for economists, mathematicians, completely by accident, prove the opposite. Now I think I can guess what the most of you are thinking. What the fuck? <laughs> okay. That's called the peron frobenius theorem. It was proven by mathematicians in the early, uh, early I think, 1920s. And uh, mathematicians describe this as a non-trivial theorem, meaning they can't work it out in their heads while they're standing in front of the class. Okay? It takes some serious mathematics to understand this. What does it mean? Well, the tautonement, tautonement means groping, you know, groping in the dark trying to reach an outcome. Again, that implies lack of knowledge. Okay? Very important distinction with modern, so-called modern macroeconomics. So the process that Volrar talked about, you can describe by using two non-negative arrays of numbers, matrices in which all the numbers are either zero or greater than zero. And that's because you can't buy a negative quantity of something, you don't use a negative quantity of inputs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an array, it's array of numbers which are either positive or zero. And this applies particularly when you're looking at a production economy. So if you're trying to extrapolate Volrar's idea of simple trade, to say trade with production, then to have equilibrium, first of all, all sectors have to be growing at the same rate, otherwise you're out of equilibrium. And then the relative prices have to be constant, otherwise you're out of equilibrium. So there are two processes that are going on there. Now that is possible, it's not a spelling mistake, I had a spelling mistake on the previous slide, if and only if, what's called the dominant eigenvalue, which is the biggest scalar number that represents what the matrix is doing. That's what an eigenvalue just means principal value. It's, it's the number that characterises what this process does to what you're looking at, which is either the vector of quantities or the vector of prices. And the only way this gives you stability is if both these processes converge to 
equilibrium, and that will only happen if you're working in T and T minus one discrete time. So production in 2016, uses inputs made in 2015, that sort of thing. If you're working in discrete time, the only way that will converge is if those dominant numbers for both those matrices are less than one. So A, which is one of those matrices, let's say its dominant number is alpha, and alpha is equal to one over, one over, uh, one over four or minus 1 over 4, pardon me. Well, if alpha is mi minus 1 over 4, 1 over alpha, which is the dominant value for the other matrix, is minus 4. They're both less than 1. Cool. But if alpha is 0 0.25, which is less than 1, then 1 yeah. over alpha is going to be 4, which is bigger than 1. So if one's stable, the other pro the one's process, so the process of price convergence, if that's stable, the quantities will be going haywire. Okay. So, which one is it? Well, that's where the peron frobenius theorem comes in. That was a complicated proof that the dominant number for an array of non-negative numbers is greater than zero. That means the process is unstable. Now, when you apply it to Volrar's vision, either the price process <coughs> or the quantity for kosis will not converge to equilibrium. So Volrar's little model of everything reaching equilibrium slowly over time, and then you can all consume, would have a whole room of people starving to death, a bit like England, really, uh, not under austerity, where no convergence ever happened, no trade would take place. Now, when it was first discovered by economists about 40 years after the mathematicians worked out the mathematics, they called it the dual stability problem. It should have been called the dual instability problem. And Jorgensen makes the point here, if the output system is stable, the dual being the price system, must be unstable and vice versa. Not the result you would have liked if you believe that price systems converge to equilibrium. So how do you react to that? Well, the correct reaction is to say, well, if you're looking at multi-sectoral price dynamics, which is what happens in a capitalist economy, you've got to buy inputs from other sectors to produce your outputs. It has to be a far from equilibrium process. The actual reaction, this is in Jorgensen's paper, was to say, well, the instability can be handled by putting suitable restrictions on the values of the matrix. Now, Blatt, who's an economist, I, a mathematician, in fact, I highly recommend reading his book. It's linked on my debt deflation website, and I'll put it up on my Prof. Steve Keen website as well, as well as Patreon. I keep on forgetting to do it, but I'll do it this weekend, actually. He said, Jorgensen's suitable restrictions on the initial value of the distribution of the disequilibrium variables, which is a quote from Jorgens's paper, are so thoroughly suitable that any system whatsoever can be proven to be stable. Uh, he simply assumes the initial amplitude of things that will cause instability is zero. And if that's the case, that will always be zero. So he's assuming you start in equilibrium to prove you reach equilibrium. I think there's a problem there. And what happened otherwise was that economists just built this stuff. So when I was doing my PhD, building a model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis using complex systems, everybody else was doing a CGE, Computable General Equilibrium Model of their national economy. <coughs> Literally the whole room, 40 or so PhD students. I think one was doing another history course and I was, and I was doing my model of <coughs> Minsky. They just built these things and carried on anyway, but they finally died out when rational expectations came along. Now that was brought in to try to get rid of an unstable model of dynamics in a single market called the cobweb model and replace it with an idea of a stable equilibrium process instead. So Muth wrote this back in the early 1960s, expectations are informed predictions of future events. Interesting way to redefine expectations. What's the logical justification for that point? Read the paper again and you will see at one point he says information is scarce and the economic system generally does not waste it. Oh, well, let's apply some neoclassical logic to that. Information is scarce. That must mean it has a price. If it has a price and you're a rational consumer, you buy information up until the point at which the marginal benefit of the information equals the marginal cost, then you'll stop. Therefore, information will be incomplete. Okay? And therefore, it'll differ from the predictions of the relevant theory, let alone differing from reality. Okay? No, that's not what he said at all. He assumed effectively information was free, infinite accuracy, 
zero marginal cost, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's nonsense. It's logically internally inconsistent, even with neoclassical thinking. But that's what led ultimately to the real business cycle world and the DSGE world. Now, in that world, they're all based on a paper written by a, a mathematical prodigy. I think he died in his early 20s, called Ramsey, back in 1928. And when he did the mathematics, it was very sophisticated mathematics, certainly for its time, it comes down to two differential equations. And K there, that's the rate of change of the capital output ratio, dk dt. That's the production function expressed in terms of a capital output ratio. Depreciation, fairly obviously, I hope. Population growth. That's the rate of change of per capita consumption. That's the desire to smooth consumption over time, which plays a major role in so-called neoclassical macro. That's the rate of time preference. And here you've got the derivative of the production function, which matters because that's, you're talking about, that's now the marginal cost function, a fundamental marginal product, marginal product function. Now, if you apply local stability analysis to that equilibrium of this system, so set it equal to zero and work out what sort of system have you got, you get a, a thing with a general form, where lambda is uh, working out a, a quadratic form, it's lambda squared minus a times lambda plus b. So you're now trying to find the root of lambda, what value sets that equal to zero. And you're going to get two roots, one of which is positive and the other is negative. Now, when you do that, this is how mathematicians describe what you've got. This is, you have, if both are positive, sorry, okay, if both are negative, it's stable. That's what you would have liked as a, math as a neoclassical economist. If they're, what actually happened was is this one, two distinct real eigenvalues, opposite signs, minus and plus. What do they say that is? Always unstable. That's the mathematician's attitude towards that system. Always unstable. That's the nature of the DSGE and real business cycle models. So how do the neoclassicals solve that problem? Well, they take that the initial value of K, the capital labour ratio, is a given, and you can't change the, that ratio rapidly. Well, they treat consumption as what they call a jump variable. So you have a particular level of demand and you get a shock to the system and you simply jump sideways. You jump across what mathematicians call the phase space. And that change in consumption instantly causes a change in savings and savings causes investment. whoopie do, you've solved the problem, you're back on equilibrium again. So here's the unstable vector space in which you're in. You were on a stable point and then some shock to technology or shock to preferences moved the saddle from one point in space to another. So you work out the mathematics of the saddle, you work out that's the, if you imagine a horse's saddle, then you work out the part that's curved downwards so you can actually throw a ball bearing from, you know, five metres away and land it on the saddle and it doesn't fall off the saddle. We can all do that, can't we? Okay. Uh, then it fluctuates up and down the saddle and it'll end up in equilibrium. That's how they cope with that one. I think they've got a hang-up about equilibrium. And this, to me, is the fundamental flaw of neoclassical economics. They believe capitalism, <coughs> without proof, in fact, without even reality, how anybody can believe the fundamental fact characteristic of neoclassical economics is equilibrium, when you sit back and say, stable, unchanging, calm, peaceful, no, exciting, maybe, but not stable. But they believe it that way. They, they prove it. They, they use a modelling method, of course, to prove that, unfortunately, it turns out to be unstable. They either ignore the result or they distort the result, and they then build what I call mythematics. A lot of my friends in non-orthodox economics regard mathematics as the enemy. I think mathematics is the friend. Okay? It's nonsense tricks like this to jump over problems that really gives what I call mythematics, not mathematics. You keep on doing it and you get extremely complicated pseudo-mathematical models, like the DSGE models and real business cycle models, incredibly hard to learn. And in that sense, they're a magnificent failure. They're so complicated, the people who build them and work on them believe it must be scientific. Now, exactly the same thing applied to Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic astronomers before Copernicus came along and said, throw away all your circles, well, not your circles, 
throw away your belief that all the circles are centre on the planet Earth and there's the circles on circles that explain why the planets reverse direction and just accept that the sun is the centre of the solar system rather than the Earth being the centre of the universe. And of course, they clung to that. The astronomers clung to the belief in the Ptolemaic system for quite some time, but not as long as neoclassical economics has existed. So economics, I think, is doing what the Ptolemaics did of trying to suppress a much simpler way of looking at the world, which requires a change in perspective we call a change in a paradigm. And part of that, essential part of that, from my point of view, is you've got to forget about equilibrium and, and understand that virtually everything interesting happens not just in disequilibrium, but far from equilibrium. And it's maintained that way over time. Now, the, the first person to realise that was actually the mathematician that Volrar approached to verify that his it will seem probable was correct. That's Henri Poincaré. That was back in 1899 solving what's called the many-body the many body problem. But that died because we didn't have mathematics to actually visualise what Poincaré worked out. But in 1963, a mathematical meteorologist called Edward Lorenz, who didn't like the linear models, mainly the linear models that meteorologists were using, took a very complicated but very realistic 12-dimensional partial differential equation model of fluid flow and truncated it down to just three variables with three parameters to explain two-dimensional turbulence. So these are the equations. Just imagine you're looking at a, a, a drop of water on a stove, effectively, and you've got the x direction of the stove, you know, the left to right, back to front, the y, and the temperature difference between the top and the bottom of the drop of water. Those are the equations. x, y, and z, three variables. a, b, and c, three parameters. It's a simple model, but it has incredibly complex behaviour. What we're looking at, a, if you've ever boiled a, put a pot of, of, of uh, thick soup on a stove and looked at the cells, don't, don't, don't get it boiling madly, just get it to raise the temperature to the stage where it's close to boiling, you'll see these cells form. And it's actually the mathematics of those cells. Now, he fed in realistic parameter values for it, and he didn't know this when he did it. This is one of the beautiful things about working in this area. He was working with a computer that worked internally at six digits of accuracy, and its printout was four digits. Got these strange patterns. There was just numbers. There's no graphs back in those days. And he gave it back to his... Uh, took one of the final set of values and gave it back to the, uh, the consistent running the computer and said, feed it back in and see what happens. It's got a totally different pattern. That's how we discovered this idea of instability. And what we call now strange attractors, there are three equilibria for that system. They are all, given realistic values for the parameter, they are all unstable. One attracts along two real eigenvalues and repels on a third. <coughs> two attract along one real eigenvalue and repel on two complex ones that give you circular behaviour. And what you get, and I'll show you this in my software package Minsky, once I find where my mouse has got to, there it is, good. is complex aperiodic cycles. And this is one thing that if you don't know nonlinearity, you don't know that this is actually possible. But I've got two simulations running there. The bottom one's saying x value from both simulations. There's a, a red and a black dot running along that screen. We're up to about four seconds so far in terms of simulating where that dot's going to be on the, on, the, uh, on the hot plate on the stove. And so far, oh. completely the same. And then after a while... A little while, <coughs> they start to diverge. And roughly 15 seconds into the simulation, they become completely different. That's why the weather is predictable only for a short period of time, and it's moving that window forward iterating forward. That's why we get such brilliant weather predictions these days compared to what you got 60 years ago. Okay? Lots of other reasons as well, but that's what meteorologists simply adopted because it made sense and nobody was ideologically committed to the idea that the weather is stable, except Donald Trump. <laughs> and the same thing about a desire to avoid equilibrium is why neoclassical economists didn't see the financial crisis coming. 
Now, I know a lot of them will, will steal the phrase from, Nis- no, from, uh, Nis- from Taleb without having read the book uh, and say it's a black swan. Nobody could have seen this coming. That's garbage. It's because they ignore what people think economists are experts on, which is banks, debt and money. Most people who don't do an economics degree would think economists are experts on money for the obvious reason that that's what they seem to be studying. But in fact, they've been experts at dreaming up reasons why you shouldn't bother studying money. And the classic for this, uh, my good mate, Lord Paul Krugman's favourite model, loanable funds. Banks are supposed to be intermediaries between savers and borrowers. And this is quoting Ben Bernanke here, saying that given that, unless there's huge differences in spending propensities between the savers and the borrowers, Pure redistributions should have no significant macroeconomic effects. Well, it's a great model. It's just one problem. It's complete bollocks. And I and a whole group of non-orthodox economists, starting with Basil Moore back in the uh, late 70s, have been saying, look, it's nonsense. That's not how banks actually behave. And we were pretty much shouting into the wilderness until the financial crisis happened. But after the financial crisis people whose careers depend upon sometimes being at least close to being right, which doesn't mean academic economists, it means economists working for central banks, they came out and said, the critics are right. This fantastic paper published by the Bank of England in 2014, saying rather than banks receiving deposits and lending them out, bank lending creates deposits. Now, blow me down if the Bundesbank didn't come out and say the same thing shortly afterwards, a few years afterwards. So I used to have to quote my friends you've never heard of, Basil Moore, Mark Lavoie, um, all sorts of people working in non-orthodox economics. Now I can quote the Bank of England the Bundesbank, which I, I like to acknowledge my predecessors, Graziani and co, but I'm happy to quote the bank here. And notice they say, this refutes a popular misconception. Now normally when we talk about a popular misconception, we mean something the public believes the experts know is wrong. In economics, this is something the opposite. The public tends to know it's wrong, and the experts have got the wrong idea. So-called experts model banks as if they're intermediaries. Most people think banks create money. Most people are right. And this, again, a lovely definitive statement from the Bundesbank. A bank's ability to create grant loans and create money has nothing to do with whether it has excess reserves or deposits. The opposite of what you're still taught in macroeconomics today in the one or two lectures they might devote to the banking sector. So, banks do not intermediate, they originate. What are the implications? Well, again, this, the neoclassicals didn't particularly like this one coming out. So you had people looking at it and saying, well, how can we analyse this and still end up being able to believe what we believed before the bank came out and said we were wrong? And two papers have done this. They both these were called overlapping generations models which are the clumsy stuff that neoclassical economists use to simulate dynamics. And this one, they said, all newly detected phenomena are connected to the presence of risks and default risk. In the absence of those, there's no difference. We can stick with our old model. Now, I'm happy to say there are some people who are different on that front. One of them, one of my best friends, Michael Pumoff, who's the chief research advisor of the Bank of England. And Michael used to work as a banker. He said he knows he created money himself. He's not going to model a world in which banks don't create money. So he's been leading a charge inside the neoclassical school and he's now knowing what it's like to be me because he finds himself being ignored and shunned at conferences even though he can build models like their models as well or better better than anybody else in the room. But he said in this case, with his model, yes, it has a huge effect. So two OLG models have said no effect, two DSG models have said significant effects. They both can't be right. Now, how do we decide? We stick in this model world or what else? Well, I've worked out a little uh, way of, mo- of, of indicating what actually happens using something I'm naming after Basil Moore. I call a Moore table. And I divide the economy into three sectors where each sector spends on the other two sectors. So the, when you look at it this way, again, it's going to be a array of numbers, negative numbers down the diagonal because that shows expenditure by each sector on the other two positive numbers off the diagonal because that's money being, expenditure being received as income by the other sectors. Now, because on the horizontal I'm showing expenditure, the horizontal sum must be zero, whereas the vertical sum can be non-zero because as an individual or as a sector, your income and your expenditure can differ. 
So I'm going to look at three, three ways of, of, of money dynamics being here. One where no lending is possible. We just have a certain amount of cash, it just circulates. And that's pretty much, that is the model that, that Friedman built in his optimal quantity of money paper, except that there were silly helicopters flying over the top of the country, dropping dollar bills out the windows every now and then. But that's, that's, my, that's, that's the world of, of Milton Friedman. Loanable funds, this is Paul Krugman's world, where lending between sectors is possible. So what I show is a transfer of money along the diagonal. One group is spending less, lending money to other people who can spend more. And then the real world, what I call BOMD, which I think is a better acronym, Bank Originated Money and Debt. We used to call it endogenous money, but nobody knew what we were talking about. So I think BOMD makes a bit more sense. Where there's a bank, a fourth sector, lending to one sector, and then that sector spends on the other sector. And I don't show the assets of the bank, I'm just showing the liabilities here because if I did the whole lot, the table would be too small to read. But let's take a look at it. So here's Say's Law. So in this one, sector one, which is this one here, is spending A on sector two and B on sector three, and therefore the sum is zero for that row. Ditto for second row for sector two, third row for sector three. Now, that's expenditure by sector one. That's income being received from that expenditure by the other two sectors. And then C plus E are the income of sector one. So obviously, the sector can, each sector can have more expenditure than income, but the aggregate must be zero. And what you get out of that is aggregate demand is necessarily the same as aggregate income. The identity is embedded in the table. And if you imagine that you can say A plus B plus C out to F are the turnover of the existing amount of money times how often that money turns over, then you can put it in V times M, Milton Friedman's equation, and you get the, the quantity theory of money. Loanable funds. Sector two lends to sector one. So there's a transfer of money going along the diagonal here. And then sector one, of course, has to be paying interest to sector two. And then sector one spends the money it's borrowed from sector two on sector three. So now what I've got there is credit. There's a flow of credit from sector two to sector one. And then that credit is spent by sector one on sector three. And then sector one pays interest to sector two on the outstanding stock of debt. You do the same mathematics there. And what you get, and I got a surprise with this, by the way. I first of all did it showing deposit interest as well. Notice you've now got interest payments turning up. And if you had deposit payments, they would turn up as well as another positive term. So gross financial transactions are part of GDP, as well as the turnover of money on buying goods and services. But credit cancels out. Notice credit is there and there, positive there, negative here. It's positive, negative here, positive there. They cancel. Credit disappears. So if that did describe the real world, you could ignore <coughs> credit. It would be valid to leave banks out if loanable funds did describe what banks did. But the real world, banks create money when they lend, as the Bundesbank and the Bank of England have said on the previous slide. So sector one then spends that money they borrowed from a bank on sector three and pays interest to the bank. So exactly the same logic, the rows still sum to zero, as they must necessarily do. Notice we've got minus credit here, there's no cancel out along here. I've got plus credit here, there's no negative term elsewhere to get rid of it. So you do your same mathematics and you find that aggregate demand includes credit. <coughs> now it's no black swan when you're ignoring that as an element of aggregate demand, which the mainstream does. Credit doesn't cancel out, it does add to demand when it's rising, it subtracts from demand when it's falling. And it's the most volatile part by far of aggregate demand and aggregate income. So even though it's not the biggest part, because it changes more rapidly than any other part, it's the part that determines the direction of the economy. Now, I illustrate this in my software package, Minsky. And by the way, I mentioned earlier that I'm uh, being supported by crowdfunding on Patreon. I'm about to launch a Patreon page for Minsky as well. So if anybody downloads it in future, you'll be downloading from a Patreon page. Uh, and the cost will be $1 a month. And if you want to just cheat and check it out, it'll be $1. And then you, you sign up and drop out again. But I want, to, I want to get the software developed further. So what I did with Minsky is build the model that 
Krugman and Eggertson had in their paper in 2012 of imagining that a bank is just an intermediary between a patient consumer goods producing agent who lends to an impatient investment goods producing agent. Now, their model of banking was quite clumsy. This is fairly sophisticated in the sense that it actually shows double entry bookkeeping and that's why I built Minsky in the first place and I'm praying that not to happen. It just crashed. Isn't that great? Come on, let's try one more time. Okay, that's better. Okay, so what I've got going on here is I'm showing the banking sector. Make it a bit larger so you can see it. And I have a consumer goods deposit account and an investment sector's deposit account and lending is from the consumer sector to the investment sector. Repayment at the opposite direction. Interest is paid from the investment sector to the consumer sector and the consumer sector pays a fee for the bank arranging the loan. Then you have workers being hired, intermediate goods being purchased, workers consuming, bankers consuming, and bankers investing. And that's the basic model. And over here, let's make a bar, I can control the rate of lending and the rate of repayment. And that's seven says that roughly speaking, debt will double every seven years, and roughly speaking, repayment will halve that every nine years. So I want to see what happens if I change that. So I simulate this and see what happens. First of all, notice you've got a growth rate of pretty much zero, GDP flatlining at 200, a rising debt ratio, but no change, and a rising level of debt, but no change in the money stock. And if I now come over here and make lending happen more rapidly and repayment more slowly, notice the economy actually slows down for a short while. There's a negative hit to the rate of growth, a bit of fall in GDP. There's now a huge rise in the debt ratio. No change in the money stock. We go in the opposite direction of I now have lending happening more slowly and repayment more quickly. Growth actually improves. Falling debt ratio. But you take a look at the whole thing and think, well, I've done all this work, should I bother modelling banks? Nah, I can ignore them. Look at the huge change in debt down here. Nothing happening to GDP. Makes sense to ignore it. Now, I can dive in here and be really nasty because with Minsky it's very easy to say, well, let's just make this more realistic. It's not true that the debt is an asset of the consumer sector because the debt didn't turn up in the bank's table because in the model of loanable funds, debt is not an asset of the bank. The bank's just being an intermediary. Debt is an asset of the lender who in this model is the consumer sector. So with Minsky, I can just say that's nonsense. Let's just delete the debt as an asset of the consumer sector, but it's still in the model as a liability of the investment sector. Having done that, I can delete the operations for lending and repayment. So that's made the model slightly more realistic. But to finish the job, I've got to now say, well, in fact, the debt is an asset of the bank. Now, since it's still stored as a liability in the model, Minsky knows that. And if I say what liabilities haven't yet been allocated, I click on this down arrow and it says, well, D hasn't been allocated. It brings across those pay operations. Of course, I've removed the interest. I've got the interest being paid by the investment sector, but no recipient anymore. So I've got to say, well, interest is actually received by the bank. I'm going to delete the bank fee completely. Now, there's more than I need to do to make the model complete, but I'll leave it at that. And now look at the difference. The increasing amount of debt is causing an increased amount of money. GDP is rising. Growth rate was positive. I've got different values to what I first... I didn't reset the values properly. I reset them back to 7 and 9 which is the same way I started the other simulation. Notice changes in your level of lending change the level of economic activity. Now, if I have lending happening more quickly and repayment more slowly, the economy goes into a boom. And then if the opposite happens, if repayment happens more rapidly and lending more slowly, you go into a slump. So there's nothing black swanish about saying watch credit to see what's going to happen to the macro economy. It's just that the mainstream has a false model that meant they didn't look at what mattered, even though their statistical agencies record the data. So that's the neoclassical model, huge changes in credit and debt, trivial changes in GDP. That's the real world. 
Huge changes in credit and debt, huge changes in GDP as well. That's why the financial crisis was not a black swan. I was not the first, by the way. Wynne Godley was. Okay, but people who saw this coming were ones who focused on credit and debt. And there's <coughs> an excellent paper by a guy who's become a good friend since he wrote the paper, for obvious reasons. But I think like he's a good guy as well. Dirk Bessemer, called No One Saw This Coming. And he then goes and says, who in the literature, whether that be academic papers in the case of Wynne Godley or blog posts and newspaper articles, in the case of people like myself, who called the crisis? And all of us focus upon the role of credit and debt in the economy, which is the opposite of what neoclassical economics teaches you to do. <coughs> so doing that, by believing it's pure distribution, neoclassical economists ignored what caused the crisis. And Fisher, Irving Fisher, whom basically Ben Bernanke said, don't bother reading uh, Irving Fisher, he understood what was going on. Explaining the crisis in 32, he said a man-to-man -man debt, and that's of course the sexism of the 1930s, may be paid without affecting the volume of outstanding currency. For whatever is currency is paid by one is received by the other and is still outstanding. So there's no destruction of money by repaying a debt when it's a person-to-person -person loan. But when a debt to a commercial bank is paid, the amount of deposit currency simply disappears. And as I've shown as well, so does the demand. <coughs> That's why it matters so much. So particularly American neoclassicals, I don't really blame the British ones so much because it's the Americans that have done the job of destroying economics after the Second World War. If you look back in the literature, you can find Fisher, Schumpeter, you can even find Pigou understanding this in a book called Industrial Fluctuations. So we turned our eye away from what actually causes this volatility. And when you take a look at it, this chart is, uh, doesn't look all that dramatic for debt. This is just the last uh, 30 years, roughly. So private debt in America has gone from uh, about 120% down a bit during the recession of the 1990s, up to 170% and then down again. But if you look along here, you'll see that credit was always positive until the financial crisis, and then it went negative now it's recovered since. Now, if I just take the credit data from that chart and correlate with unemployment, I get that correlation. Does that look like no significant macroeconomic effects to you? Okay. And the causation, as I've shown in that more table, runs from credit to aggregate demand. And you get similar results for every other country that the Bank of International Settlements has data on, except Germany, because it's huge trade surpluses means means you can have government austerity and the private sector repaying debt at the same time while still having a growing economy. Though congratulations, Germany now has a shrinking economy, another success of auto liberalism. Uh, correlation of consumer credit to household prices is astronomical. That's looking at the correlation of the change in, in mortgage debt to the change in house prices. Now, at this point, I think it was roughly here, that's when Greenspan said there were signs of froth in individual markets. No warning. Okay? It was screaming at them from the data, but they simply weren't looking at the data properly. So that's the state of economics today, but it doesn't have to be. If you look back to when Volra wrote and Marshall and Jevons and co and so on, and even right up to uh, the 1930s and 40s, we didn't have the technology to handle out of equilibrium thinking all that well. It was possible, but it was hard work, phase diagrams and stuff like that was about as far as you can go. But since the 60s, we've had computers. And you can model this instability, as I've shown you, with that top-down model that, that Lorenz built. So again, another obsession of economics is to build things from the bottom up. I'm in favour of building from the top down, which is what most scientists have done in the past until they can't go any further. And I want to show it's possible to do that and get a sensible macroeconomic model, rather like Lorenz's very first model, which you couldn't use to predict the weather, but you could use it to say what are the characteristics of a weather system. So I'm going to start from having three definitions. The employment rate. And the, the one thing I'll concede to the neoclassicals, their quest for macro foundations makes sense. You want to have a foundation that is unobjectionable for doing your economics. And they saw the previous models as being ad hoc. They don't actually know the history of Hicks's model, which they think is Keynes's. 
but it, which was actually based on general equilibrium. But I want to have a foundation as well. And what I've realised since I did my paper on Minsky back in 1992, published in 95, was that I can derive my model from strict definitions. So you can't disagree with that definition. The employment rate is the number of people with a job divided by the population. That's including a grandmother, by the way, who hopefully isn't working. Uh, not not the, the just definition of work and workforce in the economy. The wage or share of GDP, the total wage bill divided by GDP, and the debt ratio, amount of private debt divided by GDP. Now, when you do that and you differentiate them with respect to time, you get three verbal dynamic definitions. The employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds growth in labour productivity and population. The wage or share of output will rise if wage demands exceed the growth in labour productivity. And rather, I mean, this is the most complicated one as it happens in the mathematics, which is why it took me a while to realise it. And I just look, work out the mathematics and realise, oh my God, it's so bloody simple. The ratio of private debt to GDP will rise if, grow if debt grows faster than GDP. Well, duh. Okay? Now, that's, they are not, that is not yet a model. Those are three definitions stated in dynamic terms. And the hat means 1 over x dx dt, whatever x might be. So there's your employment rate. There's the rate of economic growth. There's growth in labour productivity. That's population growth. That's wage or share of output. That's wage demands. Whatever it determines, no, no Phillips curve assumption is needed at this stage. That's growth in labour productivity. Oh, sorry, that, uh, that make one of the debt ratio. I've jumped one ahead of myself here. So debt growth, and that's the debt ratio. I must have changed one of the graphics and lost the, lost the linkage there. Now, I'm going to then add incredibly simple definitions, just like uh, Lorenz used three parameters to describe those stylized weather dynamics. I'm going to use very simple parameters to describe relationship between output and GDP. So I'm just going to say our capital, capital stock, roughly speaking, determines output, a linear function for that. Investment is a linear function of the rate of profit. Employment is a linear function of output. Wage change is a linear function of the employment rate. And change of debt is all used to finance investment. So change in debt is investment minus profits. So I haven't got any Ponzi. <coughs> of course there's Ponzi behaviour in the real world. But I'm leaving it out in this model and seeing what I get. And what you get is, these, these are the equations. So y is equal to k divided by v. Uh, they've got a Phillips curve relationship in there, so wage rises depend upon the rate of employment. By the way, Phillips is far more complicated than that. If you've been told that's the Phillips curve, go back and read his papers in 1957. He was trying to build a dynamic model just like the ones I build today. He made the mistake of talking about a menu of choices, but his model was far more sophisticated. A linear idea for investment being a function of the rate of profit. Debt financing investment when, it, when desired investment exceeds retained earnings. And a constant rate of growth in labour productivity and population. Put them together and I get a very simple model like this. And if I simulate this and I have a low desire by capitalists to invest, then the model will slowly converge to equilibrium. Notice there's a low level of debt to GDP here. I've left a lot of space in the graph. And you can see the employment rates fluctuating, but the fluctuations are dampening down. The wage share is declining but fluctuating, and that'll ultimately reach a stable point. Now, if I go in again as I, as I did with the other model, I can change system parameters here. So I'm going to change the slope of the profit investment function from 5 to 10. He says, hopefully, what's happening there? Uh, it should be able to change what has happened. Let's see. Here we go. That's better. What I've got now, if you, think, if you actually want to have this, I've got more an, stronger animal spirits amongst capitalists, higher desire to invest, which seems like a good idea. I simulate this model. You get apparently the same sort of behaviour. Notice the cycles are diminishing more rapidly than in the other model. Well, there's not the other model, exactly the same model. Pardon me, press the wrong button. Exactly the same model, 
but uh, different parameter values. Ah. Always be careful when you press mouse, mouse button. Here we go. Now, I might look at that as a neoclassical economist and call that a great moderation. Keep on going, and the cycle starts to get bigger. And ultimately, that'll break down. Notice the wage share of GDP is declining. As the debt rises, it's the workers who are paying for it at lower wages. And you get a much higher level of debt, and ultimately, the system will break down. So that's an incredibly simple model, and it takes very little time to develop it, and it gives you insights into the real world, which are true. We did see what looked like a great moderation followed by a crisis with increasing volatility. I think we're going to see more of that as well. We did see a diminishing share of output going to workers. And the stability depends upon one of the parameter values what looks like a desirable thing, and it is a desirable thing if you can control the bad side effects, a higher degree of desire to invest leads to a breakdown. Now, there's, as I mentioned, I didn't have any nonlinear behavioural functions inside the model, and people often think you need nonlinear functions to get nonlinear behaviour. You don't. You need the structure of the model to be nonlinear. But I got all these things that happen in the real world out of a simple model like that, a rising debt ratio, private debt to GDP, diminishing and then rising cycles in employment and, uh, and wage of share, which is a proxy for inflation, and rising inequality because workers are getting less and bankers are getting more. Now, if I add in nonlinear functions, what I get is just more realism in terms of the overall dynamics. The numbers don't become quite so extreme. So it's possible to go across and model the same thing with nonlinear behaviour. This is what I did in the first place back in 92 as it happens. Let's see, what have I got there? Got the linear function going? It looks like the linear function. Always check these things before you run a simulation. <laughs> oh dear, where'd I put the nonlinear switch? Yeah. I can't spot it in a hurry on the screen, so I'll jump over that. I'll do it later and during, during uh, question time. Now, you can extend that model by adding prices and government and so on, and this is a model with prices inside there. And now you get a debt deflation being a real possibility because deflating prices can increase your debt level. So that's simulating its behaviour. But again, this is just derived from first principles. There's a couple of hours of calculus in deriving definitions and putting in fairly simple relationships to get a model like that. And then you can simulate it dynamically, which, of course... Uh, not possible in the neoclassical world. And notice one curiosity about this model. The last people to know capitalism is collapsing are the capitalists. That's their share of, out of output. In the model, and this is what's called an emergent property of a complex system, capitalist profit tends to cycle around near the equilibrium, not on it in a nonlinear model, but near it. And when it goes totally stable, and I think the world is perfect, that's just before the system collapses. So you need a just, you need to understand the complexity of the world in which you're in, otherwise you get very easily misled. And that's the sort of world I think we need. Now, Minsky, as a software package, has got a long way to go. It's only had about 200,000, 250,000 pounds worth of spent development time, less than that, actually. But one of my... a master's student used it to build a five-sectoral model of the Portuguese economy. So, just to give you an idea of what that looks like, a bit horrific to take a look at because it's so, the definitions have to be all done on the canvas right now. So it looks rather messy when you look at it zoomed out, but I can, for example, zoom in and take a look at a bookmark. I can check out uh, household interest paid and received, for example, and see the definitions there. So all those flowchart elements are defining elements of the program, and Minsky is generating a set of equations in the background that it actually simulates. But that model of the Portuguese economy done by a master's student is more accurate than the model used by the Treasury or the, or the uh, Central Bank in Portugal. You can also model shadow banking, and I'm delighted to say one of my then master's students, he had a degree in engineering, which sort of helps, uh, built a model of shadow banking, and he's now working with the Bank of England, analysing shadow banking. Again, Minsky being part of what he's done, so that's the model of the shadow banking system. So it's possible to go a long way with this software, far further than I've shown you beforehand. 
And that's why I think it's time for economics to stop being a baby. This is John Blatt from 1982. And I'll give a bit of a background to John Blatt before I continue with this quote here. He was a very abrasive, I never met him, maybe I'm lucky I didn't, very abrasive individual, uh, but a genius at the same time. He was twice nominated for the Nobel Prize in Physics. Didn't get it, but twice nominated during the 50s. And another charming person, Murray Kemp, uh, who's a neoclassical economist at New South Wales University and a good friend of mine, except he's beaten me in tennis every time we've played. Uh, Murray also was nominated by the Nobel Prize. And Murray regarded John as potentially, therefore, his only real peer at the University of New South Wales. So he invited John along to a seminar. John came along, sat at the back. I wasn't there, by the way. This is a story I've told by my PhD supervisor. I wish I had been there. Uh, so Murray finished his statement and then basically asked John what he said. And roughly speaking, John said, and I'm going to try to do an Austrian accent. Obviously, I can do an Australian accent. I'll try an Austrian. That is the greatest load of rubbish I've sat through in my academic career. If this is what you think is advanced math, advanced economics, there's something seriously wrong with economics, I intend finding out what it is. <laughs> he then wrote a book called Dynamic Economic Systems, which is now out of print, but I've got it on my website the Deep Debt Deflation website. So if you go to debtdeflation.com slash blogs slash blat, -B -L -A -T -T, you can download a copy. One of these days I'll try to get it republished. But this is John's summary of the state of economics after he did this magnificent amount of research, both looking at the literature and also doing the mathematics to examine the literature. His comment on economics in 1982 is a baby is expected to first crawl, then walk before running. But what if a grown man is still crawling? At present, the state of our dynamic economics is more akin to a crawl than a walk, to say nothing of a run. And I used to think there was a hyperbolic statement, but the closer we get to the climate change catastrophe, the more true it's becoming. Some may think that capitalism as a social system will disappear before its dynamics are understood by, capital, by economists. I think that statement is even more true today than it was when John wrote it over 30 years ago. So we need a complex systems approach to economics and unfortunately, it won't get developed in the university sector because universities are overwhelmingly dominated by neoclassical economists. The research funding goes that way. Uh, they exclude the alternatives, which happened at Manchester, by the way, some time back. Frankly, the of official bodies like the Bank of England and the World Bank are better because, to some extent, they get locked up in closed rooms with politicians who've been led astray by their bad economic advice. And they get, in, quite a, in putting it mildly, the crap beaten out of them. And for that reason, you'll find people in the Bank of England saying we got it wrong in 2007. Because whoever was the Chancellor of the Chequer then gave them one hell of a dressing down, and that was legitimised. We've got to look at other ways of looking at the economy. So the Bank of England has done a lot of work in that area. So has the Bundesbank now, the World Bank even. So that's more possible. And also rebels like me. I've left the university sector. I'm happily, I've done what I've said for many, many years. I couldn't wait till I retired so I can get some serious work done. And I'm now being supported on a website called Patreon, which is a, a crowdfunding site. And if you know Kickstarter and Indiegogo, rather than being a one-off sum, this is commitment to give us, if anywhere from a dollar a month up to the, the biggest donor I have giving $1,000 a month. That keeps me close to my university salary and I can continue being a thorn in the side of mainstream economics indefinitely. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming here today. It's great to see so many faces here on Valentine's Day. Um, the professor is going to be taking questions now yeah. from the audience and he'll be taking them one at a time. So anyone who wants to ask a question, just stick your hand up and I'll come running to you with this microphone. It will hopefully work. Uh, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, we'll be back up. Here we go. Hello, great talk. Um, Thank you. Uh, parts of payments uh, aren't in your model. I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. It used to be uh, a major concern of economics, and now it doesn't seem to be an issue, and yet 
Yeah, asking, uh, that's that's one area. Like there's a, I'm I'm supportive of an area of approach to looking at the, uh, monetary flows called modern monetary theory, but I disagree with them on the role of the trade deficit. And they pretty much see a trade surplus as a bad idea and a trade deficit as a good idea. You get goods in return for pieces of paper. I think that's fundamentally wrong. So to me, I, my position, and I'll need to develop it in an elaborate Minsky model with. Uh, multiple countries and sectoral balances and so on, that sort of thing, is that fundamentally when you make a sur trade surplus, you're effectively outsourcing your money creation to another country or forcing the, other, the export surplus forces the hand of your central bank to put money in your bank account and take it, money comes out of the other. So I think that's the major constraint on an economy, a trade deficit. And of course the UK is what, about a 5% of GDP? trade deficit now, something of that scale. So I think you, Keynes's idea in, in the, in the uh, proposal for a bank call back in Bretton Woods was to limit trade deficits to no more than 2% of GDP, or trade surpluses to no more, no more than 2%, and to penalise countries running trade surpluses so that they would try to keep balance of trade. And I think that was a wise idea. And unfortunately, because the Americans insisted upon the American dollar, and we didn't have a bank or created, there was no such control mechanism put on the major country in the global system. And we now have trade surpluses in the case of countries like Germany, Japan, China, Switzerland, Norway, running at about 10% of GDP, which of course means matching trade deficits in the aggregate elsewhere in the world. So to me, my way of thinking, we really needed what Keynes designed uh, to, to limit the scale of trade deficits and trade surpluses. And one of the main reasons I think that Europe is such a mess is because the euro makes that even worse. So that makes a very important issue. Following on from that question, how do you see the euro mechanism and the targets and balances where effectively the Germans are creating money, which is going over the Italians and the yeah. How do you see that playing out eventually? Badly, I think <laughs> in a word. I mean, it's this, Italy is not running a trade deficit at the moment because it's been demand has been suppressed so much that they're running a trade surplus. But generally speaking, what you've got is the south of Europe running a deficit, the north running a surplus. And it really comes down to the rates of inflation, which when you look at the, the, the gap between the inflation rate of Germany and that of France and that of Italy before the crisis, the agreement, I think it's in the Lisbon Treaty, I'm not sure, Lisbon or Maastricht, I think it was Lisbon, the agreement was they targeted a 2% rate of inflation. Now the Germans suppressed wage demands, and also of course you had unification effects still playing through, suppressed wage demands so that inflation rate in Germany was 1%. France hit 2, and until the crisis, Italy was running at 3. That meant every year, France is getting 1% less competitive with Germany, and Italy was 2% less competitive. So over time, because you can't, there's no exchange rate of mechanism, that made it worse and worse. So there's huge private debt imbalances between the two countries. There weren't fiscal flows to, to make up for the difference. There are private debt flows. And to give you an idea of the scale of those, I think I've got, I'll bring it up. I'm going to cheat a bit here and so show a new software package. Let's see if I can just, uh, that's very small screen here. Let's just see if I can find. Make this a bit larger. Pardon me, I've got to cheat with my visuals here. This is an extension to Minsky I'm working on for numerical analysis. So let's just look at um, Spain. That's what I was looking for. And of course, the Maastricht Treaty completely ignores private debt. So when they were lauding themselves for a falling level of government debt, that's what happened to the private debt. Okay, enormous private debt, but which of course generated those target two uh, imbalances, which are now astronomical. So I think at some point, I think the euro has to collapse. I'll just make the numbers turn up on screen properly. Has to break down. Somebody's going to leave in a very violent fashion because Brussels won't let to leave peacefully. And when they do, then all those balances, I think, are going to be denied. Ah, just stopped up my. Okay, so that's, those imbalances have been caused by the system obsessing about government debt, which is one of those three balances, and ignoring both the trade deficit 
and the private sector, which I think are the two important ones. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. Hope that's okay. Is it, yeah. 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 Um, um, Speak up because we're hoping the microphones will pick it up. Uh, considering the problematics of leveraged finance and leveraged loans increasing with do you think the role that the bank plays within leveraged loans is going to be seen the same way it was seen before 2008? I'm hard to understand you without the microphone, but you, you say the, the role of the banks. Mm -hmm. and I think we have to drastically constrain the financial sector. We've allowed them to lend basically to finance asset price inflation. They haven't lent for entrepreneurs, which is the best justification for private banking, is private <coughs> banks deciding which businesses deserve working capital, which entrepreneurs deserve money, and they don't do anything like that. And in one sense, there's a good reason for that, because if you lend to entrepreneurs, if you lend to six of them, five of them are going to go bankrupt. So you lose your money on five, and all you get is a rate of interest on the sixth which is not worthwhile. But if you made a change to the banking rules so that banks could take equity positions rather than debt positions in their investments, then if five out of six fail and one becomes a gigantic success, that can make it functional for them. It's still difficult, but I'd rather control that. I'd rather stop them being able to lend on the basis of asset collateral, limit the amount of lending that could be done for mortgages on the, to the income of the asset being purchased, not the income of the borrower. So you get away from the leverage competitions, we all get caught up in buying properties right now, which means even though it's worse for us, we actually want a high level of debt because if as an individual borrower and you want to buy a house, you'll win now if you borrow more money than the other person you're, you're competing against, which is the exact opposite of what we would want. We want people to you know, save more money in that sense, bank building society style, to buy, to win the contest rather than take out more leverage. So a whole range of changes are needed to make the financial sector fit for purpose. But Minsky's point about the financial sector is still valid. And that is, he said that he sees capitalism as being inherently unstable because of characteristics the financial sector must have if it's to be compatible with capitalism. And that is that it'll generate signals that give you an increasing desire to invest and also finance that investment. And that's what I showed in that very simple model. So we have to be aware of that and redesign the financial system so it doesn't cause, it, it can cause cycles, but don't let it cause breakdowns like it did in 1929 and like it did in 2008. I hope that's a reasonable answer to your question because I couldn't really hear. Yeah. Okay, good. I think I can talk loud enough. <laughs> I'm concerned with students who go home and speak to mum and dad who've been listening to BBC Radio 4. There's, there's just no common ground to have a conversation about economics. Yeah. Um, the commentator at the end of the last open statement stated that the national debt was money we have to repay. Yeah. Now, how do you stop the bloodshed over Christmas dinner? <laughs> I think it's the same thing as applied stop the bloodshed over Christmas dinner in 1500 or thereabouts when Copernicus came along and said even though you see the sun rise and set it's not the sun that's moving it's us spinning okay. and it took the experts to say that before a child came along and said I think the sun's the centre of the universe avoided being excommunicated from the family by dad so, so long as we have a profession which leads us astray, those conversations are going to continue. And that's why it's so important to reform economics, because it's misleading us about the nature of what it's supposed to be explaining, which is capitalism. So I think we're stuck with those until rethinking economics wins. So don't stop, guys and girls, please. Keep on fighting. Emulate our speaker behind and speak loudly. Um, do you think there's any legitimacy in uh, private banks being able to break money? Do you think that, that power should be taken away from completely? Not completely. This, I'm on the advisory board to Positive Money, and I have a lot of time for the Positive Money group. I'd recommend if anybody wants to get, get involved in those conversations, what you could do is say, tell your mum and dad, come along and join me at the Positive Money group, because they are doing a very good outreach program about the nature of banking here, and they're a, a very good bunch of people. They're in favour of 
taking away the right to create money of banks. So actually setting up what economists think is the case now, banks would have a pot of money at the central bank out of which they could lend, and as that pot went down, their capacity to lend would diminish. And that would then mean the amount of money being created would be a decision of a committee, which they want to have independent of the government, but still a committee of bureaucrats and academics and experts deciding how much money to create. And the banks are supposed to make money out of lending, like arbitrage. You, you pay a small rate of interest on deposits, charge a large amount on loans and make a profit that way. I'm very skeptical about whether banks could actually make a living that way at all. I know they make far too much money right now, far too much profit. I know people in the finance sector who gets paid 10 times what a professor earns, plus bonus, which a professor doesn't get. Um, so that I want them to be smaller than they are now, but I still want them to be viable. So my worry is twofold. One, banks would not necessarily be viable in that situation. I, I want to seriously test it out before I tried it. Two, I don't trust bureaucrats in the same sense that I don't trust bankers uh, to make the right decisions. So, but a private bank, the, the encouragement in bureaucracy is not to make a mistake. So you get this enormous, if anything goes wrong, you get a, you hire 20 more people to stop it happening again, and you get this huge growth of the quagmire of bureaucracy. Um, with private banks partially taking risks is in the, in the system. You, you want them to be taking a risk because of the chance of enormous profit. So both Mariana Mazzucuto talking about the government sector and Bill Janeway talking about venture capitalists say that innovation occurs, is, is financed by groups who can afford to make a loss. And the government can afford a loss. The mayor of America had a huge loss on the, Luna pro, on the, on the Apollo program. They didn't make any money at all out of the moon. And capitalists can lose large amounts of money on some ventures but make huge amounts on the other. So I want something like that in there. I want something resembling private creation of money, private provision. But it doesn't have to be banks. It could even be crowdfunding. Okay, there's all sorts of possibilities there. But I want... You want... The real defining positive aspect of capitalism to any other social system is innovation. And we need a financial sector that supports it. We don't have it now. We sort of had it in the 50s and 60s. We don't have it now. We need to rebuild it and stop it getting out of control again. So I want a bit of both. I want, a, I want private money creation, but I want predominantly that to be government money creation. So I'm sort of 80% positive money. saying that um, mainstream economists believe that uh, velocity is the sole parameter which determines uh, the increase in the money supply. Yeah, largely speaking, that's, that's not far from the truth. Let's just take a look at that, because that's a very good point. This is, um, usually the uh, increase in velocity is negligible. Exactly. Well, it's actually going the wrong direction, and, and I think there's a good reason as to why. So how do they explain growth? Then? Pardon? How, do, how does a mainstream economist explain growth? Then? Oh, angels. <laughs> this is the velocity of money, the broadest measure called the, called the uh, money of zero maturity. And you can see that back in the 1960s, which is as far back as they've... It's an artificial time series, but it tries, it tries to find all the various things which have zero maturity. Money, obviously, cash being the most, uh, most like that. So it's a manufactured series. But if I go back to... Hang on, I'm trying to get the right mode for my pointer here. Go back to 1960s, it's a bit below two. Then you get the inflationary period, the 60s on, and it screams upwards and hits virtually 3.5. Actually, it hits 3.5. So money was turning up 3.5 times each year, I think partially in response to the high rate of inflation. But then Vokler comes along and terminates the boom and look at the trend... And now it's heading down towards one. And I think that reflects the increase in private debt that occurred at the same time as well, because people are trying to save money to pay service their debt. But this is one thing I, I want to drive out of economics in general. Saving in the aggregate is zero. Defined in monetary terms, savings is zero. Expenditure is identical to income. There is no gap. Okay? So the idea of savings itself is a myth. 
at the macroeconomic level. But because people try to save individually, what they actually do is they're reducing GDP. So if you try to save, you slow down the velocity of money. And I think that's a major side effect of the increase in private debt is just that, which of course makes us more dependent upon private debt because that's the only way that new money turns up. So you're quite right, but velocity of course is going the wrong way. Shout a bit. It's, it's going to be hard to pick up on the microphone. Uh, you were talking about the role of banks as the arbitrator for investment and potential for new innovations in, in that role. Um, do you think that cryptocurrencies can seriously help with that problem? Uh, cryptocurrency is a way of creating money, true. So it does actually increase the stock of things which are accepted in the exchange of goods. The trouble is, I think Bitcoin was based on a whole series of myths, and it's the dominant monetary form. So, uh, a so-called Sakatoshi, I've actually, Richard Werner, who speaks Japanese, translates that in a, a very, it's a forgotten the actual translation, but it, it's, it's a made-up name, clearly, and it means something like wisdom, in some sense. So, the Sakatoshi creator, uh, the Bitcoin creator, really believed money is gold, and designed it as a sort of digital and analog to gold. And there are only 21 million of them, and you've got to mine it, and it costs a lot of money to mine, etc. And, and the, no matter what happens, it takes 10 minutes to validate any, any transaction. The overall outcome of that, the number of transactions per second that occur in Bitcoin, I think is running between three and seven right now. Now, there's more transactions taking place in Manchester per second than Bitcoin can support. So it's just the wrong model. And I think Bitcoin's going to go to zero. And they're talking about adding various things like the Lightning Network on top of that. I saw a, a technical takedown of the Lightning Network a, a few weeks ago talking about the various steps that are necessary to use Lightning, both for the retailer and the shopper. It's a nightmare. It's too complicated. Uh, so cryptocurrencies, as they've been designed, won't necessarily work. But, for example, the Bank of England is working on digital money. And one of their ideas is to create a digital money account so we'd all have accounts at the central bank and they could put money in there. And then the, the idea of the blockchain, it's not the same idea of a distributed ledger, it's a centralised ledger. Um, that would work better. I'm not a, I'd, I'd, if I was asked what's the major problem with banking, I would never have said inaccurate accounting. I would have said fraud, okay, but not inaccurate accounting. So I think... What Satoshi solved was the wrong problem. And then because a lot of people in the crypto space are gold bugs, then they've jumped onto the bandwagon and pushed the gold side of things. And I spoke at a conference in November last year, I think, in, in um, I've forgotten the name of it, Birmingham. And I said, look, it's a bubble and it's going to burst. And people were buying my book for a fraction of a Bitcoin uh, when it was worth about $15,000. And it reached 19. And they were still listening to notes how, how well they'd done buying my book cheaply. Well, they did. But the Bitcoin now is worth, what, about what, two or three and a half thousand? I think it's going to continue going down. But the idea of a cryptocurrency itself could be sound if it was based on a sound model of money. Uh, you mentioned about uh, obviously economics departments being staffed primarily by neoclassical uh, economists um, and by extension about sort of heterodox economies being pushed to uh, yeah. department, economy, etc. Um, so that means that obviously students who come and study economics at the university um, could then leave the university being increasingly unaware of. The Hopefully not blissfully, but yeah. Well, yes. Um, of, the, of, the, of the failures of, of neoclassical economics, and they go on to take on really influential positions in uh, society and um, civil service, etc. Mm. Um, what do you feel uh, needs to be done to change uh, the, the makeup of um, economic, economics departments um, and what sort of leverage as a rethinking economics movement do students have? It's really difficult at university because academic economists are insulated from all this stuff. I remember my own colleagues back at Western Sydney, when the crisis hit, 
I took them totally. They were rubbishing me beforehand, saying it's going to happen. I, I, I had a very non-orthodox department, but there were some neoclassicals who were good friends inside the department. They'd be ribbing me about talking about a crisis until it happened. But then after it happened, they'd be saying, oh, it's bad regulation, bad policy, et cetera, et cetera, not bad economics. And I'm saying, look, it's bad economics that led to this stuff. Uh, but when, once it happens, what tends to happen is they retreat back into microeconomics. So I remember having doing some talks in Australia just after the crisis and having one young, enthusiastic neoclassical graduate saying, oh, you know, macro's a mess, but micro's pretty good. And I went, bullshit. That's the whole basis of debunking economics, was to say how bad the micro is. The empirically completely wrong. Mythical ideas, but which are, which are coherent enough to be convincing, but are completely wrong. But once you have them, it makes you a zealot for believing that you should make the real world like the textbook. So I see most of my neoclassical colleagues as accidental zealots trying to change the real world to look like the textbook and the belief it'll work better. And by doing so, setting us up for things like financial crises. Now that makes it really hard because you can't shift them. They run the journals. I, had a, I submitted one of my papers to the AER, rejected unrefereed, sent my money back, I said, send it to a journal, more, more of a more appropriate journal. I thought the AER was an appropriate journal to talk about financial crises, but obviously I was wrong. So I sent it to the AER macro, and then I got a rejection from the... But the editor wrote to me, and he had actually read the paper, and he said he'd like to see an explanation of how markets clear, which is completely wrong, because they don't. Okay? But we had an a, argument. I was in a pretty bad mood that day, so I had a bit of a fight with him. At the end of it, he finally said, and I, and I quote... And it's still, I look at this and I think, what, what a world we live in. Talking about people who said, but what if they get more information about the future? How would that change things? How on earth can you believe there's such a thing as information about the future? Okay. <laughs> Editor of the AER Macro. Okay. Olivia Blanchard, who's become a person I correspond with off on Twitter, and I, we have a nice level of warmth and relationship. He wrote a paper in August of 2008 titled the state of, which has the state of macro and said the state of macro is good a year after the financial crisis began. So it's really hard to change the academic world and that's why I've given up on it fundamentally. Uh, my feeling is if you want to do it, the best thing you can do is go and encourage an engineering department to run a course on, on, on economics and say so if the economists explain, uh, complain about it, go and support them, let them, let them run the engineering economics. But don't use an economic textbook. Use system dynamics, which you guys already know, to build the models of economics. Grab some books by mathematicians, like Roselli or Blatt. So support other dis disciplines, because any other discipline, unless they actually start by reading neoclassical and thinking they should put it into their terminology, would never invent anything like neoclassical economics. So become friends with mathematicians and engineers, biologists, meteorologists, and encourage them to develop their own approach to economics. If the economists scream, let them scream. Also, get jobs in places like the Bank of England, the Bundesbank, the World Bank. They're more open, even though they've still got that same religious fetish to some extent. They have to have some alternative perspectives as well, and that's happening a bit, certainly inside the Bank of England and the Bundesbank. Oh, sorry? What time are we on right now? Do you know? Wait, wait. What time are we on? 6.30. 6.30. Two more questions. Yeah. Uh, your Minsky simulations yeah. seem to be single economy. Have you tried to model globalisation? Have you tried to model global value chains, offshoring? And what, what would happen if there is a 20% fall in sterling on your models? Yeah, I've done... I did models of that using what's called the golden age economy model that Joan Robinson developed 30-something uh, years ago. Uh, and what I get out of that is multinational corporations causing personal income disparities uh, and then uh, a decline in overall output. In terms of doing it in Minsky, Minsky isn't sophisticated enough yet for that. So we, we need to have our flows in Minsky dimensioned by you know, widgets, dollars, but also pounds, and then exchange rates and so on. So I'm hoping, I'm trying, one reason I'm trying to raise funding for Minsky through Patreon, and that'll be up in about... I hope two or three weeks' time, uh, is to get the, the money I'm not getting from the government's funding bodies like the ESRC, uh, 
to continuously develop Minsky and add those capabilities. So it's definitely a target. And to me, like a major problem in economics is the theory of international trade, which is neoclassical fantasy on steroids. And we need a realistic, dynamic, monetary, non-equilibrium model of international trade. Uh, and Minsky, the intention is to get it to the stage where it can do that. So, and I'm sure when I do, what I'll find is trade surpluses let you industrialise faster, which is what Germany has been doing until its crazy economics got in the way. Uh, there's imbalances increase inequality. You have financial crises coming out of it, as we've seen with Turkey, all that sort of stuff. But I haven't had a chance to formally model it yet. You obviously say that uh, you know, things are not going to end well. I don't think that you're alone in thinking that. Uh, but uh, where, where or what would you say is going to break first? How do you think it's going to break and when? Uh, well, I've, my last book was called Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? A 25,000 worder, by the way, so it's an evening's read. Um, but in that, I, by looking at the credit dynamics that I'm showing you here, so if I can bring that back up again. Where are we? Too many, too many models open at once, okay. Uh, I identified a number of countries that have got, like obviously Spain's not got a debt bubble going on right now. But if I go and take a look at, uh, make it a bit larger. Let's look at Australia. It's Belgium. Oh, going the wrong way. So a range of countries, including Australia, hang on away. Okay, they're going through a credit burst at the moment. So countries like Australia, Canada, potentially South Korea, maybe Norway, Sweden, a few possibilities like that, are going to have a localised version of what happened in 2008. That's a slump coming their way. But a whole range of countries that are relying or hoping they can get back to a, a boom again, like America. If you look at America's situation, that's easy to do because it's the last one on the, on the table. Then you see that they had, uh, you can see the private debt bubble there. I went too far with my, let's go back a bit. Um, so they had a huge credit bubble and then a burst. Now, if you look at the level of credit now in America, it peaked at 15% of GDP before the bubble burst, plunged to minus five. It's since risen back up again, but it's beginning to flatline because with that level of debt, it's a bit like having climbed to the peak of, of, of uh, Mount Everest and come down to one base station. You can't get up very quickly or go very much further again. So what you get is you'll fluctuate in and out of rising levels of debt and particularly when central banks who don't understand what they're doing, like the Federal Reserve, put up interest rates, that'll discourage borrowing, encourage repaying debt and cause a fallback in credit again. So what I see is not so much a crisis at the, the scale of 2008, but localised crises for countries that avoided 2008 by continuing to borrow private money via massive bank fraud, as we're now finding out in Australia. Uh, and then in the country that did have the crisis, fluctuating levels of private debt. Every time they think the economy is back to equilibrium again, put the rates up, they'll cause people to delever again, and you'll fall back down. So I'll show you Japan on that front, but that's, that's the most instructive country. I, my little line about what is actually happening is that the, the world's turning Japanese. So there's Japan. And you can see that it had a huge debt bubble up to 1990. And then it went from positive credit, running at about 30 or 40% of GDP at one point, to negative credit. And then pretty much for the last 20 years, it's been in negative credit, sometimes severely negative credit. It's just gone into positive credit now. But that period there of negative credit on the, on the, on the uh, predominantly negative credit lasted 20 years. Now, Japanese society cope with that because of its demographic trends and socially it's very cohesive and it has a very good welfare system so, and a huge amount of government spending. Like in terms of, we always focus upon, focus upon government debt. I'll see if I can actually show you the two here. Let's see. 
Did I crash the program or not? Let's see. Hang on, let's go back here again. Okay. Everybody focuses upon the level of government debt. But government debt didn't start rising in Japan until after the crisis hit. So they can get away with it, but the rest of the world won't because it's, Japan was running a huge trade surplus, still is. That insulates you if you're running a huge government deficit. If you're running a deficit like the UK is doing and you want to run a huge government deficit at the same time, then I think you're going to have problems with your currency, as Turkey has shown as an extreme example. So what I expect instead is a... I don't expect it like a Turkey collapse for the UK or America or anything like that at all. But what I do expect is booms and slumps. And every time the boom comes on, the authorities who think they can control things just using the interest rate and ignore the level of private debt will trigger the private sector to go back into deleveraging again, meaning you fall back into another slump. Do you just have to, you know, the traditional way, you just have to burn your way through it? You, you, you have, have to get rid of the private debt. And what I've been arguing for for about a decade now is what I call the modern debt jubilee. Because when you look at the fact that banks create money by lending, and the central bank creates money by financing a government deficit, the central bank has got an unlimited capacity to create money, and it doesn't face the limitations that private banks do because it can recapitalise itself, it can run negative equity. These things have both happened in recent years for central banks around the world, including the UK. So you could have the central bank, through that digital currency idea, for example, creating money for all of us, and those of us who've got debt have an offset account against the debt, reducing the effective debt burden, and those who don't have debt get cash they can spend, or you could redirect it saying you've got to buy newly issued corporate shares, which are used to reduce corporate debt, so you could do the opposite of what QE did and democratise share ownership. And then, to my way of thinking, we've got to get back down to the debt level that we saw back in the um, 1950s and 60s. And if you look at the United States, that was a debt level, like back in 1959, of about 75% of GDP. Now, that level of debt is a level where the debt is predominantly financing what you want it to finance, which is working capital for corporations, some entrepreneurial activity, and large consumption items for consumers where they can't be expected to buy you know, a car with cash most of the time. So reduce the level of private debt, and we could do it tomorrow, given the capacity of central banks to create money, and do it for the public rather than for the private financial sector, what, what uh, positive money calls QE for the people. So we could get out of it very easily, but of course it's the ideology that we're fighting and the dominance of creditors in our society over debtors. And on that front, I highly recommend a book by a good friend of mine, a new book, and Forgive Us Our Debts, which is Michael Hudson's explanation that Jesus is actually a campaigner for a debt jubilee. And we need to have regular debt jubilees or use the government's capacity to create money to reduce the impact of private debt. Forgive me, without that, we've either got, we've either, we've either, we'll either have another, another crash or, or decades of low, low no growth. Yeah, and I think well, what I think is going to actually get us out of the crisis is what got us out of the crisis last time. And that's an existential threat. If you look at what happened with the UK, the UK in particular, the government deficit in 1940 was 40% of GDP. And nobody said, we can't afford that final percent because nobody was going to say we want to produce less bombs to drop on, to defend, less weapons to defend ourselves against Germany. So the existential threat meant all the type talk about, you know, having to balance the budget and stuff like that went out the window. It's existential survival. I think that's what's going to happen this time once we realise just how serious climate change is. And by the way, isn't it a great day in Manchester today? <laughs> Winter and 13 degrees? Oh, that's, that might sound like a weather statement, but I do know what I'm talking about, unlike Donald Trump. All right. What an answer to end on. <laughs> I'm sure there are still lots of questions out there, but I think we're going to have to close up the evening now um, before we get kicked out. Um, so thank you so much again for coming to the okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.